This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by the Writing Mastery Academy. Founded by Jessica Brody, author of the best-selling plotting guide, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. The Writing Mastery Academy features online, on-demand writing courses, including the official Save the Cat Writes a Novel companion course. Novel fast drafting, crafting dynamic characters, and productivity hacks for writers to name just a few, plus monthly live webinars on various writing topics. Go to jessicabrody.com slash hank to learn more and get your first month of unlimited access to all the content for just $6. That's right, just $6. jessicabrody.com slash hank. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Barbara Lynn Prost on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book. It's called The Sound Between the Notes, and uh, what a fantastic novel. What a great exploration uh, of well, we're going to talk all about it. You guys are going to know exactly. I'm I'm struggling to find the words, uh, just exactly what this book has meant to me, and I think you're going to love it too. Welcome to the show, Barbara. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining me, uh, Barbara. We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, that's a great question. I actually can answer it. Oh, I that's great. That my I wrote my first book at age seven, complete with illustrations. It had 10 chapters in a little black notebook, and I still have it up in the attic somewhere. It was called At Home With Us. So I can say I've always written, even though it wasn't always fiction. I wrote nonfiction for many years. I wrote a book for parents on raising out-of-the-box kids, for example, but I've always written. So how old were you when you uh, first, uh, you know, wrote the notebook? Seven. Seven. I love that. I love that. Um, Barbara, do you remember um, this? This happens for a lot of kids, I think, um, is that you're you go to the library, you go to the bookstore or, you know, your parents bookshelf or whatever, and you just see rows and rows of books. And at, at one time, it, it feels like that books just were always there or that they just came out of the ether some somewhere. And, and then at some point there's a realization that happens that there are people behind these books and that, that someone sat down and wrote a story and then other people became involved in the process and they, you know, helped publish the book and, and all of that. And that there are, there are actually, actually people behind the books that we see on the shelves. So, um, so Barbara, as you grew older and, uh, you, you know, a, a lot of us have these ideas of one day writing a book or, um, you know, being a storyteller, whatever that means to that, you know, the individual person and somewhere along the way, you know, life gets, uh, life happens and, you know, raising a family and paying bills and all of that stuff takes predominance, uh, you know, over life. Uh, but somewhere along the way that, writing kind of calls back out to you and and that desire ramps up again. Did did you have an experience like that? That's an interesting question. I mean, I wrote um like many of us, you know, my really bad novel when I was, you know, in my 20s. And, <laughs> you know, we all, we all do that. And as I said, I did I did um different kinds of writing. I I set fiction aside and I spent a lot of years writing um nonfiction and I wrote articles you know for parents and I, I was a an academic and I wrote all these more scholarly articles than I care to remember but there was <laughs> a certain point maybe about four or five years ago when for whatever reason I got tired of that and I longed to return to writing fiction so for me it was 
a shift back to my the first kind of writing that I had loved as a child. And I think probably in the back of my mind, I was always going to do it someday, but the moment was ready. Do you, looking back on your, uh, your nonfiction writing, um, do you categorize that type of writing differently than, than fiction writing, you know, um, other than the obvious one is is made up stories with characters that that come from your subconscious uh, and the other is you know uh, your your thoughts on mm-hmm. on what is yeah. you know true about the world um but uh, you know other than those those surface things do do you approach those two um types of writing differently yeah i love that question cuz this is something i've thought about a lot i've actually just written a blog on this for me it's really like two different parts of the self, that when I'm writing fiction, I really have to get in what I call that zone of enchantment, where I am just kind of channeling, or I feel as if I'm I'm listening for the, what the characters need me to do, and I'm very immersed, I'm very intuitive, there's something um, subconscious almost about it, although of course the conscious mind is needed to create, you know, find the right words and so forth. Writing nonfiction is much more analytical. You know, you're, you're um, thinking about how to take uh, ideas and kind of elevate them to a slightly more intellectual level, um, how to universalize. Um, But when you're writing fiction, you go the opposite direction. You, you take maybe a universal theme like, um, fulfilling one's dream, and you particularize it, you make it very specific, you embody it in characters. So it's really a different process. I like them both, but I can't do both at the same time. Interesting. Interesting. They, they just, they absorb, uh, their own, or or they, they come from different parts, uh, of you that you just can't, you can't work on both of those at the same time. I really, I really feel that at least for me, I can, when I, when I'm working on it, on a new novel, this is my second and um, I have a third one that's will come out next year. It's very immersive for me. I really have to be so in tune with the characters and so much. um, I don't, it's sort of hard to explain. You're, you're really giving yourself and, and you can't, uh, it'd be like trying to go out with two guys at the same time. You just <laughs> you can't put the energy into it. So um, for me, the world of writing a novel is very immersive. That's not to say that afterwards there isn't the very meticulous, you know, endless editing and all of that. That's another, that's a very different process. But you're asking about the emergence of the story. Right. So last year, uh, you published your your first novel that you had published, Queen of the Owls. Is that right? That's right. So, what was that the initial spark um, that birthed that book? For that one, um, I thought you were going to ask me about publishing two books during a pandemic. Which <laughs> well, is... <laughs> that that's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, here's an interesting. This is an interesting story, Hank. Actually, I had written the sound between the notes first and it was going to be published but it wasn't right I knew it I knew there was something that I and and I'll I'll tell you what was wrong with it in a minute and I luckily I listened to my intuition and I and I said to to my publisher said well actually I have another book (laughs) can I switch them and I had written Queen of the Owls which came out very organically in the course of a year and it was really a great book to debut with. And then um, while I was doing the final edits on that, I was going, I went to a, a music intensive and I understood something more deeply about music and about the people who do this for a living and how generous and loving and positive they are. And I realized that the protagonist of the sound between the notes as she was at that point was too snarky. She was too angry. And I got it. And I went back and I did one more revision. And now it is the book that it needed to be. 
So I actually published them in the reverse order. I'm so glad I did because the sound between the notes needed a little more time. So I'll weave back to your actual question about Queen of the Owls, um, which was the result of, of a number of influences. Um, it's really the story, of course, of a woman who has been dubbed the owl, the brain, and needs to claim her, her beauty, her body, her sensuality, the other side of herself. So that was a kind of dichotomy that I very much grew up with. I was, duh, I was the owl. <laughs> and it wasn't until later in life that I was able to embrace and integrate the other part and it wasn't it's not that I'm not pretty which I was I just didn't identify myself that way and so I think that Queen of the Owls and I hope that didn't sound conceited but I mean you, you know what I'm saying I just yeah, didn't course. I didn't own it I didn't own it and and so <laughs> Queen of the Owls very much came out of my own journey it is in no way autobiographical there is nothing in that book including posing new that I ever did um yet but um uh, that's a joke <laughs> but but the the emotional journey of the protagonist was very much mine and i think every author has a story like that that she needs to to tell and i, I call it cooking life into fiction because you take the raw material that you've lived your own emotional truth and you re-embody it in a fictitious story so, so that was so. Queen of the Owls had, in a way, a very organic um, journey for me. And Sound Between the Notes is a more complex book. In a lot of ways, it's it's more accessible because um, we've all questioned where do I belong? Where do I fit in this world? How can I fulfill my my passion with and yet still do right by those I love. So I think that sound between the notes is going to have a wider reach in over the long haul, although the books share a kind of theme about how art can help us be more whole and more authentic. So I've just said about 25 things at once. <laughs> that, that was perfect, that was perfect. Um <laughs> Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web speaking of uh, of art and um you know the importance of that do you being a, a self-described owl um as you did do you find um that it's that it's difficult to get to allow yourself to be artistic and to to plug into that creative side of yourself well, I'm not that owl anymore. So that was part of my early journey. But 
um, I, um, I study piano, we, I'm what they call a serious amateur, which is that I take serious lessons from an amazing teacher and I work at it, you know, in, in, every day with, with a lot of joy. And so I'm not creative in the sense of writing music, but when you play music, you have to be creative because you have to feel it. Sure. Um, it requires mind and body and feeling and, and soul. So what I love about studying piano is that it, it allows me another artistic um, path that's not based on words. You get out of that word making part and open to more to something else. And I find that so enriching. Um, and I know several other authors who are amateur painters. So I think there's something about having another, another channel open for sure. Yeah, well, that was going to be the next thing I asked you is because I know that you are a, a serious amateur uh, pianist. Um, do, do you feel like that? Do you ever see the intersection of those two artistic pursuits, writing and playing piano? Do you ever do you ever are, are you ever playing piano and then your subconscious mind just starts running through story ideas or, or have you ever uh, been been stuck in a book and just not sure where to take the characters and then at, as you're playing piano um, that thing works itself out no that, that's not my experience I mean when you do one you have to do it with your whole heart you can't be thinking about books while you're playing piano but <laughs> there's two other answers I will give you though that are a little off a lot of my best ideas when I'm writing or when I'm stuck they don't come from staring at a, at a laptop. They come when, in the shower or when I'm walking and yeah. I'm, something is free. And maybe um, the, I think even in the shower, you know, you're just feeling the pounding water and the heat and you're not thinking about it's like not looking at it directly. And then there's room, there's silence for the idea to just make itself known it always comes to me like that and when I was working on um, my latest book I took a walk every day and always something new would come just from this emptiness of empty mind you know like in a zen but the other p other thing I wanted to say about your question is the sound between the notes is framed around a particular sonata by Schubert it opens with her audition and then the climax is during her concert. So that's a, and it's an extraordinary piece of music in the most part is too hard for me, but every sonata has a slow movement that is much more, um, uh, I want to say transcendent, heartbreaking, you know, just very emotional, uh, the, the, the slow second movement. So I set myself a goal of learning that part of Susanna's Sonata before publication date. And I'm proud to say that I did. And I don't, it's not too shabby. I, I can actually play that probably better than any piece I've ever played because I love it so much. So I, it was my way of um, trying to be close to my protagonist. You, you mentioned earlier, Barbara, um, the fact that that you published two books during a pandemic, which, um, <laughs> you know, for for someone, uh, you know, who had such amazing work and ready to come out. Um, boy, 2020 just was not the greatest time in the world to to be doing that. Um, but, uh, you know, you you never had the other experience of, you know, doing book tours and all of that stuff. So what what was your experience last year when when you realized, mm -hmm. OK, that the book is ready to come out and now the whole world is shutting down? <laughs> what, that, that had to be nerve wracking. It was like it was such a strange thing in so many levels, because, of course, I would can I canceled a few things and then I said, but I'll still get to do this other one. You know, I kept on thinking that it was only going to last a few weeks, as we all did. And at a certain point, I realized that I had to let go my my vision 
of how this launch was going to be and pivot and be flexible, which I, had, I was part of a whole cohort of, of debut authors who were going through the same thing. And there were several things that happened. One is that the online groups, a lot of them were reader groups on Facebook, opened their arms and hearts to us, were so generous at offering opportunities to reach people virtually. And the strange silver lining was that through that virtual platform, I got to connect with people who never would have come to a live event, you know? I mean, people across the country, people maybe who couldn't get childcare. Um, you know, it, it opened up in a strange way, um, a much wider audience. And although I was sad not to have those, well, it's always hard not to have things go the way you picture. But I do have one amazing story about this, which is that with Queen of the Owls, my, my dream event, because um, it's framed around the art and life of Georgie O'Keeffe, I was going to be going out to Ghost Ranch where O'Keeffe lived and worked uh, for a great big hoopla with the whole ranch and the whole city of Santa Fe and all that. And of course that was canceled. But I kept up my relationship with the people there who are the most extraordinary people. And six months later, I did a virtual event on O'Keeffe's birthday through their platform for Ghost Ranch. So I got to have that dream event in a different form six months later. And I tell that story because you just never know. And you just, have to go with what's happening just stay open um the other thing that was odd about launching during a pandemic is that i had to reconcile um the sort of self-promotion with people suffering and dying and how could i how could i do you know how could i talk about myself and then i realized that books and stories have always been a source of healing and renewal and encouragement and and hope and that they are that now too. So I had a gift to give people. I didn't have to apologize for that. And that was very powerful. 100%, 100%. Um, yeah, we, we just, we don't know how our stories are going to affect other people and, and, uh, and now more than ever, uh, we need those stories. Uh, yeah. So the sound between the notes, I, I find it very interesting that you had this book ready already, um, before, uh, and, and shelved it, uh, to, to bring out, um, the other book first, Queen of the Owls. Um, I, I'm curious because you said that the that the tone, the voice just wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And what was it intuitively that let you know that 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 character just wasn't right? Because I, I think a lot of people make that mistake that, you know, a book is finished and, you know, the book is, is done. It, it's time to take it out to the world. And um, and sometimes, you know, putting it away for a little while and just letting it rest while, you know, and, and maybe you're not thinking about the book. I mean, you, you wrote a, another book and brought it out um, in, in the meantime. Um, how did you know that that, <laughs> that book wasn't ready yet? It's a great question, and it's not so easy to answer. I think when – I'm a funny duck because I have this very brainy side. I have a Ph.D., but I also do have a very intuitive side – and I think I was able to just trust that um, and and take that risk of, of, of waiting, wait. And as I said, it was when I was at this piano seminar that I, I saw how the teachers were just so full of love and joy. And I realized that my protagonist, um, she had a kind of chip on her shoulder because she was adopted and she felt that she had not been chosen. And so she wanted to be chosen as a musician, wanted to be um, accepted. And that may have been true, but, but um, it couldn't be the dominant color of her way of being in the world. And 
the music had to come out of out of love and so I, I can't exactly answer your question except to say that if you if you set your anxiety and your ego and your ambition aside and listen to your intuition, sometimes um, it's really telling you something important. Um, and it's a much better book. I mean, it's I'm just so grateful because the story was always terrific. The writing was always terrific. But the central character, if you don't feel that you that you care about her, you're not going to stick with it. And now Susanna is a person that I think people have, everyone who's read it has just bonded with her so strongly. So tell me about Susanna. Where, where did this character come from? And um, like your other book where you said that, uh, that it was not an autobiographical book, but it was definitely informed by your experiences. We'll put it that way. Um, is Susanna that way as well? Uh, yes. I mean, I am a mother by adoption, so I'm familiar with the world of adoption and um, what it's like to be in different places of that triangle. And um, so I don't believe I could possibly have written this book without that. It, someone I know who is an adopted adult had read an early version and she said, I can't believe you got it just right. You got it just right how this character feels. Um, and um, so, you know, I don't um, especially share my personal life in that way because my, my I protect my children's privacy. But, but definitely the sensitivity to the adoptees' question. We all wonder, you know, who am I? You oh, know, yeah. where, where did I get my traits? Am I, you know... People say that you're, you look like so and so, and and all of that. And but for an adopted person, it's much more complicated. And the other thing I really wanted to show that there are no villains in this book. Everybody is doing right as they see it, is doing the best they can. So it was very important to me to bring out the humanity of her biological family, her adoptive family her husband and her son and that that these bonds the connections we feel with people can take many forms um and in, in, interweave in surprising ways the um the the sound between the notes um susanna is is a piano player and uh a, and has an experience that uh, that a lot of us can um, can resonate with, and it may not be her her uh, specific experience, but um, you know, I'm I'm going to be 50 this year, and there are so many things that I wish I would have done when I was a younger person um, that you know are are just kind of lost to the ages now. You know that their their hopes and dreams that 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 may not ever be. You know, I w- I would love to. Um, you know, to have been a skateboard uh, champion, and that's just not going to happen at fifty you years never, old. You, know? you never know, Hank. You never, you never know. You never know. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying never, but you know, um, but but Susanna is, uh, you know, she's also wrestling uh, with uh, kind of the longing to do something, and I, I'm I'm kind of talking around it because I, I want you to fill in what you want to fill in, um, and she she has the opportunity, and now it feels like life is taking that opportunity from her, um, which is, uh, you know, another great metaphor for um, what we, the changes we go through and, and how, um, you know, we deal with the the cards we're dealt in life. Um, but tell me a little bit about the, this idea of the, the, the musical metaphor. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, so because um, she was adopted, so, when her son was born, she made this decision to put him first because she felt that her birth mother had not put her first, which is not really true, by the way. I mean, a birth mother's decision is very unselfish. But in any case, she had this, she, um, 
she limited her career to local venues because if you want to be a, con a a real professional pianist, you got to be able to just uh, drop everything and go when there's sure. an opportunity. So so she she kept her career small. She still played. She taught. She did things. And when she, in an unexpected moment, an opportunity presented herself. The timing's right. Her son's a teenager. He doesn't even want her around him, you know. So here it is, the moment that she never thought, she thought she'd, she thought she'd renounced it forever. And then suddenly it's being offered, which is a kind of an amazing thing right there. And, and yes, then she is, something happens in her fingers that threatens her, her chances. And so what a, what a tension filled, uh, situation that is actually, this was kind of interesting in an early, early version of the book. I'm telling you all the ways it didn't work. I, I did. I, I love hearing all the ways it didn't work. That That's a fascinating part of the process. Yeah, they, they go through. Yeah, yeah. So I had this whole adoption thing and I had the whole piano thing and I, I didn't know quite how to bring them together. So I thought, I wonder if there's a hereditary disease that would affect someone's hands and fingers. And so good old Google, I Googled, you know, hereditary disease of the fingers and it spit out the perfect disease is <laughs> called Dupuytren's contracture. And so that was the way that those two things were linked. And Dupuytren's doesn't typically present itself until maybe you're about 60, but, but she's 40 and that's, that's not unheard of. It's rare, but it, it's, it's certainly within the realm of the possible and is very much hereditary. So I was really, I wanted to um, have that, I wanted to be able to to make sure that I was saying everything I said was credible. So I Googled Dupuytren's contracture pianist. Come to find there was a world famous pianist named Misha Dichter who had that and was able to get treatment and went on to play. So I, um, this is actually kind of good. So I, I looked him up online and I, wrote to his agent and explained what I was doing and said I'd be very grateful if I could ask Mr. Dichter a few questions, maybe through him. So like a day later, my phone rings and it's Misha Dichter calling me. <laughs> oh, wow. He was so gracious and generous. So I was really fortunate to be able to find out from an actual really world famous pianist what it was like to have this disease start to affect his fingers. So these magical things can happen um, if you're kind of fearless. I mean, I just thought, well, what do I have to lose? I'll write to him, you know? Um, <laughs> so it wasn't even the question you asked me, but but um, did I answer it? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, with a with a challenge um, like Susanna's faced with, there there are so um, you, there were so many ways that you could have approached this, and the book could have turned out so many different ways. Um, but it is uh, uniquely profound in uh, in the way that we follow Susanna's journey. Um, did you know how this story was going to end when you first started thinking about it and conceiving of the story? Well, it, it's interesting because with with both of the books, I had, I had, and I knew the ending, but in both cases, there was an, a twist or an aspect of the ending that didn't appear to me until I was almost there. So, um, uh, I don't want to give anything away, but the very, but very final scene, which I would call Susanna's true concert didn't come to me until I got to know her deeply enough to understand that, that was actually had to be the final moment of, of the book. And I, I like to write books that are both satisfying in that there, there's a resolution, but there's also something unknown. Um, we don't really know what's going to be in store for her. But she's she's found 
internally she's found what she needed. E externally, we don't exactly know how the various things, like her father is starting to have dementia, for example, and you know we don't know how all those things will play out. But but the internal uh, journey, the emotional transformation, I think you have to hold that from the very beginning so that you know who your character needs to become. But you might not know all the details of what that will look like on the page. Sure. So, Barbara, after launching two books during a pandemic, um, what – what do you think about how the books have been received? It did, um, it, you know, it's it's such a weird thing when when you bring a book out, uh, especially your first book, and uh, you know you've lived with the story for so long, it means so much to you, and you know it's there's this moment of just standing, uh, you know, on a cliff and <laughs> deciding whether to take that step or not, and you know and. And then seeing what the what the book does when it comes out to the rest of the world, what, how do you uh, feel about the reception that your books have gotten and how deeply it's touched people and the feedback that you're getting? You know, I've really been lucky um, that well, Queen of the Owls, you know, has gotten amazing reviews. It's it's either one or been finalist for like six awards and it's it's really it's not for everybody but the sure, people sure. who find it and read it have loved it and and found that it really spoke deeply to them and so far although the sound between the notes is only a week old it's it's really the same thing i haven't gotten a bad review the people who've read it have just loved it and so I think you have to kind of know who your audience is. You're not going to appeal to everybody. So you want to reach the people that it will speak to. And um, so actually, the, the thing I'm really proud of with the sound between the notes, even as a newborn, <laughs> is it it's, was the recipient of a very rare starred review from Kirkus. Kirkus is like that really strict teacher who never gives an A, you know, right. I mean, we're all terrified of Kirkus. They're very, they're very, very hard to please. But it got a starred review given only to books of, um, quote, remarkable merit. Mm, so that's that fantastic. felt really good. And um, it's, you know, it's just starting to get out there, you know. Um, and I, I think that it will, um, it will end up, speaking to to a lot of people because it it has a lot of a lot of layers i mean the initial feedback was oh my god it's a page turner i couldn't stop reading you know compulsive you know suspenseful which it is it's a really page turner story but it's a lot more than that it's very profound it's about identity and belonging and family and and um and finding your place in the world, you know, so it's, it's, it, it, I think it works at two levels. So anyway, I've been, but you know, I've, I've lived a long time. I've also been a therapist. Um, I've been a teacher. I've been a mother. Well, I still am a mother. And, and so I think you can't write a book like that without having lived and been a sort of student of human behavior and, and having come to a, a, a greater understanding of people. I couldn't have written this book at age 25 or 35. Don't ask, right. don't ask me how old I am. <laughs> Over 35. <laughs> but we know that you're 37. Don't, but but yeah, seriously, yeah. I mean, I think that you need a certain degree of life experience, um, struggle, and seeing other people suffering, which I got as a, as a social worker and a clinician. Um, so there was a kind of readiness for me, um, this is a kind of culmination of of many things I've done in life. That, uh, and I'm, um, you know, I, of course, we would love to reach as many people as possible. But a book is not. I, I like to say a book is not like a bottle of milk, where if you don't drink it in a week, it's going to go bad. 
Right. A, a book. A lot of books are like bottles of wine, and and they ripen and they reach people. You know, maybe a year later, maybe two years. You just have to both um, keep putting yourself out there, and you also have to let it go. Right. Let it let it take its own journey. Absolutely. Well, the new book is available everywhere now. Uh, the Sound Between the Notes. Uh, you guys are going to love this book. It's available in Kindle edition and paperback. Um, however you like to read it, you can grab it. We're going to put uh, links to it in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Barbara, if people are just learning about you, uh, where can they find you online? Well, I have um, a wonderful website. It has um, photos and links to all kinds of interviews and YouTube um presentations i've done it's a it's a fun website um and it's www and it's barbara lynn probst one word smushed together l-i-n-n so one word barbara lynn probst.com couldn't be easier excellent we'll put links to that in the show notes as well uh barbara this has been so much fun chatting thank you for taking time to come on the show today well thank you for having me and um you know i'm a talker but most I, this is my favorite subject to talk about, and you've asked some really great questions, and it's been fun to to, uh, to, to just to be here and to speak with you. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical, yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started. Are you looking for software that helps you bring your novel to life? Novelize is a web-based writing app which allows you to access your work on any device with a browser and an internet connection. Write from your desktop, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Just get the novel written. Say goodbye to sticky notes. With our notebook on the side, you can keep track of all the important information you need to write your novel. We keep distractions to a minimum help you track your progress, and encourage you to write more novels. You can even use the same notebook for your novels in a series. Outline, write, or organize your novel by switching between modes. You can write your outline notes while you're writing, and you can move scenes and chapters around anytime in the organize mode. Choose between the dark and light theme to help prevent eye strain so that you can stay immersed in your book. Novelize, the app for writers by writers.